So my, my name is Carlos Coimbra, and I, I'm a colleague of uh, George Tynan in the Mechanical and Aerospace uh, uh, Engineering Department. I also, uh, his colleague in the Center of Energy Research, uh, and most of my research is on uh, solar forecasting, uh, which is, uh, as we're going to be discussing, is like an enabling technology, like to integrate solar energy, like uh, into the grid. So, uh, George was talking about like examples of what. Uh, terawatts are, like, you know, I, I find that most people have a hard time understanding what a terawatt is, like, or even what a one trillion uh, is in terms of, a, of a magnitude. Uh, but I like this slide a lot, like, you know, this is, uh, if you consume your normal 2,000 calories a day, uh, the type of uh, energy that your body needs, like, from the environment is about, like, 100 watts continuously. Uh, and uh, if you live in North America, you are consuming in excess of 100 times like that amount, right? So like this is, so the, of course, like the 2,000 calories a day or 2,000 kilocalories a day uh, is the subsistence uh, life, and, uh, but we are taking much more of, like, from the environment uh, with the lifestyle that we have. So as uh, George uh, mentioned, like you know, this uh, is not uniform all over the world, like you know, there is a substantial change uh, from different regions, like you know, this is very strongly related to climate, uh, and uh, I, I like this uh, line of a thinking. Like you know, that if you if you are alien species arriving on Earth today with uh, our physiology, uh, and you had to decide where to place people on this planet, and there was no people at all, uh, we would never place people where they are now. Right? <laughs> so there are places that like are really tough, like you know, uh, in terms of like you know, the energy requirements that. Uh, because we evolved in, uh, in the tropics, like, right? Uh, so there's a huge uh, difference of a distribution of uh, energy consumption, as you can see, like uh, along the tropics. Uh, the sad cases are like, you know, like, like the Emirates, for example, now per capita, like they consume more energy than the US. So this is a clear case of uh, exporting uh, temperate technologies like uh, into a place that like did not need to consume that much energy, uh, which is one of the tragedies of the way that we evolved our society, right? Uh, but the reality is that, uh, you know, if uh, everybody was to consume at the rate that uh, we consume in North America, uh, we would need 70 terawatts, uh, which is uh, 10 times, like, all the hydro potential of the planet. So, like, that would not cut it. Like, you know, if you go through all the different, like, energy sources, like, you know, you find out that uh, uh, almost everything comes short. Like, you know, nuclear is, like, a one uh, exception. Uh, but the... Solar is by far, like, you know, by orders of magnitude, like, you know, the only energy source that we have that, like, can, uh, in the very long uh, run, uh, supply this tremendous thirst for energy that our brains have, right? The body cannot take more than 100 watts. It's really the brain that is the monster here, right? So, like, uh, you, uh, the energy potential, like, the solar energy potential, of course, not all of it can be used, but, like, it's 85,000 terawatts, which is more than what we need, hopefully. What's, what, what's the challenge? Like, you know, the price of uh, solar installations has gone down, like, you know, uh, as a rock, like, you know, even faster than, like, we predicted uh, in, the, in 2009. Uh, uh, the prices, uh, nobody could predict, like, how cheap, like, you know, like the PV panels became. Installation costs are still uh, the dominant cost, like, at this point. Uh, but the challenge here is that like even though you have market penetration like you know everybody that uh, is smart enough to get solar panels in their houses are th these people are saving money today uh, you have a limit on what you can have in terms of grid penetration and this is mostly because uh, you know the solar and uh, wind uh, sources are variable like and like you know, therefore like there is a penalty for the quality of like the energy that you can hook up in a grid that was designed to be very static, right? Like, you know, the, the electrical grid is not uh, dynamic, uh, uh, it's not yet, like, you know, very dynamic. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, we normally talk about how much it costs. Like, you know, a lot of people think that the problem of, uh, with solar and wind is that, like, it's an these are expensive technologies. But the cost, like, a grid parity exists already in many, many locations, like, you know, in many locations within the U.S. already. So cost is not really the issue, like, you know, and there's even, like, you know, some argument that can be made, like, that uh, you want primary energy to be a little bit more expensive than it is, because, like, that can be a boost of a quality of the society that you can generate, right? 
So if you, if you turn this question to the other way, uh, and instead of asking how much a kilowatt hour costs, like a, but you, you ask how much a kilowatt hour produces of uh, wealth in a society, you find out that like, you know, countries that have a lot of a cheap primary energy end up being very little productive, like a very uh, uh, not productive in terms of our energy, right? So you can have a countries like US that are very business productive, but still uh, not energy productive, right? 0 0.36 compared to 60. Denmark has the most expensive uh, energy in uh, Europe by far, right? Uh, if you go down here, there's almost a, a, a list of uh, countries that have more uh, renewable generation uh, uh, as, and they generate more, more uh, uh, economy out of those kilowatt hours. So what's the problem with solar? I have a, a nice uh, little video here to show you. Like, you know, this is the sky in, a, in a Eva Beach in Hawaii, like in the leeward side of Hawaii. Uh, on the right, you are seeing the normal, normalized like a beam radiance. Like this is the direct normal radiance that's coming from the sun. Is that like a black dot there? Uh, and you see, like, even these very thin clouds can bring down the direct normal radiance to zero. Like, you know, it's not uh, uh, to, like, I don't know, moderate values. Very complicated problem. You have clouds, like, you know, cumulus clouds coming in this direction. Like, you know, the nimbus are going in the other direction. Very difficult to predict, like, you know, how much I'm going to be able to produce because of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is really, like, you know, the, the problem here. We know exactly what the energy uh, the sun is producing outside of the atmosphere, but... We, we typically want to produce energy uh, on ground, right? Uh, so my group, uh, we work uh, a lot with this, uh, with this problem. It's a very complicated problem, and I give you an example of a short-term forecast, five minutes, just to give an idea of the complexity of this problem. Like, you know, these are, this is a cloud field here. These are processed uh, uh, images here, and you can see the forecast there three different types of a forecast, like you know, the gray is how much uh, irradiance is really hitting our sensors, and, uh, and these uh, little snakes here are forecasts five minutes ahead. And you see, like, you know, we, we catch like, you know, very nice, like you know, this is the arrow here, like of all these three types of forecasts, and we catch some variability very well, like our others we don't, like, you know, and it, this is a problem, like you know, if you are relying on that uh, technology and you don't have a good storage or if you don't have, like, you know, a way to mitigate this variability. I'm almost there, right? Look at more. Okay, uh, I let this run because it's beautiful. Like I don't know if you guys like this, but uh, so how do we do this? I don't have time to go through it, but like I don't know. We basically uh, we take a tremendous amount of the data, like we ingest all of this data uh, into like a forecasting engine, which is like I don't know a multi-layer algorithm that uh, process. Uh, all this data in a very smart way, selects what's important, what's not, what makes a difference for the forecast, and it spills out like a forecast that can cover like a many different time horizons from like a five minutes ahead, 10 minutes, all the way like to a week ahead of what, how much, how much we're gonna be uh, producing. Uh, and now I think I'm only two minutes to go. Like so major challenges, as I said before, like to no, achieve a grid parity, like this already exists for some locations uh, uh, within or uh, outside of US. Uh, generation costs below 0 0.06 kilowatts per hour, like you know, this would make solar extremely competitive. Uh, this not really the major concern that I have in my mind because this will happen, and, like, and it does not happen more for political reasons today than anything else, like it's not a technological bottleneck. Uh, but these three things here are really technological bottlenecks, is how do we storage uh, energy overnight, like you know, I think it's a good segue uh, uh, for the next uh, talk. Uh, variability smoothers, like a short-term storage, the things that can ride, like you know, the, the five, 10 minutes uh, of uh, variability that I just showed. Uh, and uh, the energy quality, which is related to both of these, uh, through forecasting uh, and mitigating uh, technologies. That's my talk. Right. Okay. <laughs> I talk back, back on yours, right?